I'll call this meeting to order. This is Tuesday, April 1st, and this is the 4 o'clock uh, session, uh, informational meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council. I'd like to welcome everybody in the audience here today and uh, thank all the councilors that are here also. Um, we're going to start out with, uh, with the staff report. Uh, Lori Hogstad, our city clerk, please. Hi, city council. Um, Lori Hogstead, city clerk, giving you an update one week away from the election. Hard to believe it's almost here. Um, we are now down to the fine details. Um, just to give you some updates, first of all, absentee voting is going very well down at the county. Um, as of about noon today, we had 887 uh, absentee voters that either had mailed in their ballots or had come in person. Um, absentee voting will continue uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday from 8 to 5. Saturday, we will have the voting available for citizens from 8 until noon. And then again on Monday from 8 until 5. Um, Tuesday will be for messengers only. You cannot vote in person on Election Day at the county auditor's office because you instead can go to the arena or to First Lutheran, one of our vote centers. Um, so that is going well. We are helping out staff-wise a little bit with that because they have been so busy. Tamara spent a good share of today down there assisting with absentee voting. Um, that is going good. Um, election schools. We had election schools on the 20th, the 21st, and the 27th, a total of six. Um, five were scheduled, and we ended up having a makeup class. And out of our 143 workers, 135 attended the schools. Um, it went very well. We started in here with uh, just going through the ins and outs of, of the election at the vote centers on election day. And then we uh, went into the multi-purpose room and we had Secretary of State Jason Gant here along with his team and we did uh, training on the electronic poll books. Um, some of the workers did come back for a second session on electronic poll books um, just to make sure they're entirely comfortable, comfortable with them and many of them um, when they were done said, oh, this is so much easier than I thought. Um, so um, excited to try it, to use our e-poll books. Um, one thing I brought up a couple weeks ago, a publication that we had put into the paper, and this was an insert that was in last Thursday and will be in again this Thursday. It's a total of 12 pages. Um, a question was, what was the cost of the publication? And it was $19,440 for that particular publication. That's for two publications. But we had to do it. Um, it contained the, the notice of election, the map, the list of the vote centers, the sample ballot, and then we had to print um, the two referred measures in their entirety, um, one of them being, of course, shaped places, which was almost 300 pages, and the other being a rezoning ordinance, was, which was just one page. Um, and then they did print, you know, the maps and so on in color um, so that it would be somewhat readable. It's, it's small, but um, it re really did turn out very nice. They did a really nice job on that. Um, vote centers, we've been continuing to stress um, the use of vote centers on Election Day. I just did uh, two uh, television interviews today, and I, I brought it up several times. Hopefully they'll use it. Um, as much as I brought it up. We are also going to post signs and maps in those precincts that have been used in the past. For instance, in 2011, when we held our special city election, we used the 50-some precincts. And then, of course, um, County Auditor Bob Litz used the precincts for his 2012 uh, primary and general election. So we compiled those lists, and we will have signs and maps in all of those facilities um, indicating where a citizen can go to vote if they would happen to um, go to one of their precincts out of, out of habit. So hopefully we'll have that covered as well on election day. Um, just a lot of details right now. I won't go into all the, the ins and outs of the little things that we're doing to prepare, but um, we're right on track and ready to go on Tuesday. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions for Lori at this time? Yes, Councilor Staggers, please. Yes, uh, Lori, um, there's been a question raised about uh, the ballot and that December 15th and December mm -hmm. 31st. Can you say something about that? Sure. Um, I did get that uh, request uh, sent or dropped off in person yesterday. 
Um, and I had a couple hours to respond. Well, you know what? I wasn't here. I was at another building working on um, our ballot inventory, et cetera, and did not get back here until the very end of the day. And so I did take a look at it when my first opportunity I had, which was early this afternoon, um, and uh, read through their question regarding the transposition of the date from December 31 to December 15. Um, the year was 2015, they are correct. It was, um, it was an error in that date. But in going through the material, um, I determined that um, the transposition in the date did not um, affect the, uh, it was not material really to the ballot issue because the ballot issue is, are we going to build an outdoor pool at Spellerberg Park? And the uh, dollar amounts were, of course, correct. The, uh, the size of the property was correct. Um, you know, we apologize for the error. It did happen. But again, it will not affect um, the expression of the will of the voters once they go to the polls um, on Tuesday. So that's, that's my uh, response on that. Are there any other questions for Lori? Lori, again, I thank you. Um, for, for as much as we've, that you've put the time in, for those of, those of us that have been involved with the process too, I'd like to thank you and, and uh, Bob Litz also. You've done yes. a great job. Your team has done a great job. Um, and uh, I know there's always a couple of hiccups here and there, but I think uh, we've been able to overcome those. And again, I'd like to thank you for, uh, uh, and uh, thank you for the updates that you've given the operations committee throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. Those weekly updates, I think, have been very good. So great. thank you very much. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, we will move on now to uh, council open discussion. Is there any council discussion, Councilor Karski? Um, moving away from elections for just a little bit anyway, um, last two months there's been two alcohol stings, um, alcohol checks, compliance checks, and um, I was very impressed and excited to see that there have been absolutely no violations. And that's just a shout out to our um, employees, the um, businesses that train their employees, and the job that they're doing, uh, sometimes we sit up here and we hear about the bad side, but it's just great to know that the last two have been 100% compliant. So shout out to the police department, but mostly to the, the businesses and the employees that are doing those checks. So thank you. Great, good news. Is there anything, Sue, please. I just want to remind uh, our viewers and the council that we will be having a fiscal committee meeting immediately following uh, our informational meeting. Um, the topic of discussion this afternoon will um, be a presentation that will highlight how street construction projects are selected by Public Works and that they will also discuss contractor incentive and disincentive uh, programs. Great, thank you. Is there anything else? Councillor Steggers, please. Yes, I, I was notified by uh, a citizen uh, from the southeast in regard to the uh, issue of deer. Um, the citizen uh, is concerned that there's simply too many deer in the southeast. And then adding to the problem are, is a pack of coyotes uh, that are kind of roaming in the area. Um, the citizen had con contacted the uh, uh, police department about this, and they sent out traps to try to get the coyote, but they, they haven't been successful. But the individual is becoming frustrated, and I didn't really know what to tell him. Um, Jim and, and Sue, you know, both of you are from that area. Is there any suggestions in trying to? Well, I know that we had asked the, if I might, we had asked the Sioux Falls Police Department to, and uh, the Parks Department to give us an update as we get into the summer season mm -hmm. about where we're at with this. Uh, in my particular area, where I leave, live, there hasn't been any issues uh, uh, with any coyotes or anything. Mm -hmm. um, we always have deer issues. There's always deer out in the back, back there. Um, but Sue? Well, as you may recall, Counselor, we did, I did bring this um, subject forward to the Land Use Committee, and it is my understanding that it will be reviewed again um, after the, the new uh, committee has been formed. Um, I also have gotten concerns again about the deer population and the overabundance of deer and the domestication of the deer. The deer don't seem to be frightened by uh, pets or human beings. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. 
Um, I'd, I'd comment on that too. I've had some, um, some calls on that and um, I plan to bring it you know, uh, to the Land Use Committee after the election, assuming I'm still around, and we'll, uh, if not, it should go to the Land Use Committee anyway for a relook, because they did look at it about a year ago, and that was, a, that was the way they were um, supposed to do it. Councilor Steggers, I'll also put the question out to the Police Department again, too. I see Patty is here, Assistant Chief Lyons is here, and we'll have her get, have them get us a, an update. Okay. If uh, even, I think, an email update to us, Councilor Steggers, would that be sufficient, or would you like a presentation made? If we could have a presentation, sure. that, that would be better. Assistant Chief Lyons, will you see if we can get that put on the, uh, the docket, please? Thank you, Patty. I noticed that there's deer and there's coyote, but there were no jackrabbits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, I couldn't pass it up. I'm Barsky, sorry. Barsky, you're up. And I was thinking there, yeah, this wasn't a USD conversation because oh. they're not coyotes. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I'd suggest, too, that we reach out to uh, Game Fish and Parks um, so that we get... Um, somebody from game or law enforcement or whatever from them at the same meeting, so thank you. Staff will take care of making sure we make those arrangements, please. Great, is there anything else? Yes, sir. I, I, I'll be serious on this one. We do have a uh, transportation task force committee meeting tomorrow at 3.30. Uh, public is welcome. We'll take some uh, input from them uh, along with some exciting things that are um, on, the, on the agenda, so uh, come on down if you want. Great. Here at Carnegie. Right. Is there anything else from any of the other counselors? Just a couple of reminders from the chair. Um, the uh, council meeting and the uh, uh, committee meetings for next Tuesday have been uh, canceled or rearranged. Uh, we want to make sure I know all of you uh, hope that, as well as I do, that our constituents and all of our citizens get out and cast their vote in next week's election. We want to encourage everybody to get out and attend our vote centers. Uh, we're confident that we've made it easier for people to get out there and do their work. Um, and vote for the issues. Um, also, just a reminder to the Council that on April 10th, we will be having a Council work session. Specifically, we've, we're, we're going to be talking about the uh, three items, tax increment financing again. There's a couple of questions that we've had on that that will be brought up. Annexation, dealing with the, the Special Assessment Ordinance and also the Prairie Meadows Annexation. Uh, Councilor Roffing has brought up. And then the Capital Surplus, and we hope that we're going to have a, uh, be given that information hopefully uh, uh, prior to that meeting by, uh, by the administration. So, and I have, reached, uh, I have reached out to the respective directors, uh, and we will have representation from all the directors or from the respective departments. Departments, um, at that meeting also. So that being said, we will move on to the uh, presentation, the Vehicle for Hire Ordinance, and Jim David, our Legislative Operations Manager. Jim. Good afternoon. Jim David, City Council staff. Agenda, third, agenda item 34 tonight is a first reading of a proposed changes to the Chapter 124, the Vehicle for Hire Ordinance. This proposal was initiated by the Public Services Committee more than 14 months ago. It included nine committee meetings with public input, one working session, several one-on-one -on -one meetings, and was a multi-department effort with council, city attorney's office, and police staff. The Public Services Committee looked at other Midwestern regional cities for guidance as it looked through the Vehicle for Hire Ordinance. These cities ranged in size from 108,000 in Rochester to 421,000 in Omaha. It also ranged with the number of taxi cabs with 22 in Sioux Falls and three in Rochester. Last month, the Public Services Com Committee finalized their recommendations and approved the following changes by unanimous vote. It tackled inspections. Right now in ordinance, it requires an inspection by the owner, by the company, every 3,000 miles or three months, whichever is first. And those documents are to be available for city inspection. The proposal requires an annual inspection by a certified mechanic, but DOT inspections can be substituted for limousines and buses. If you look at the regional cities, the seven cities listed below there, two of them require a city inspection, two certified mechanics, and three have self-inspections, but the state of Nebraska, which regulates vehicle for hires and taxi cabs in Lincoln and Omaha, does random inspections. 
the committee determined that the fuel surcharge should be eliminated. This surcharge is an upfront fee that may be charged by a taxi cab that's in addition to the fare. The surcharge is figured by 10 cents per trip for every increase in 15 cents in the price of gasoline over $1. It is currently $1.70. A taxi cab, if they want to utilize this surcharge, must send the planning department notice with at least one receipt justifying the increase or decrease. This is an example of the current form that is used for the fuel surcharge. It was just done in February, and the receipt next to it uh, for uh, $14 was the justification for the fuel surcharge. The ordinance also includes consumer protection. A taxi cab fare must, uh, or excuse me, a taxi cab fare must be conspicuously displayed in the taxi cab. It will include what is allowed by ordinance, the maximum, but also what the taxi cab does charge passengers. By request, a receipt, a detailed receipt, must be made available to the passenger. Overcharging is prohibited, and a direct route is required unless requested by the passenger. The committee also looked at taxi meters. It was found through the process that there's something called Handbook 44. South Dakota recognizes 2005 weights and measurements set by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, also known as NIST, which is a division of the Department of Commerce. This is a 500-page document that regulates anything from water meters to odometers to grocery store scales and taxi meters. The new proposal includes language that says that the taxi meter and its accuracy must comply with South Dakota law. The committee also looked at taxi meter seals. You look at from the regional cities that were reviewed, every city requires that the taxi meter be inspected and sealed with the exception of Des Moines. The proposal includes language that says that the taxi meter should be inspected by the city or their designee. Designee was added in to give the city flexibility. If they did not want to inspect it, they could actually do an RFP and select a private entity to do those inspections. Now also a question was, is how often does a taxi meter need to be recalibrated? Uh, it needs to be recalibrated if it does, if there's transmission work done or it does receive new tires. But if the taxi cab has the air inflated or deflated, there's no need to actually readjust or recalibrate that taxi meter. The committee also addressed the ordinance dealing with business licenses. It says that a business license should not be issued until the taxi meter is sealed, it has commercial plates, is in compliance with ordinance, has a sales tax license, and is in good standing with the Department of Labor. It also fixed the loophole. Right now, the ordinance requires that a driver be licensed but it does not require a business to make sure that their drivers are licensed. And under this proposal, that is changing. It also updates the suspension revocation language. Right now in ordinance, it just has revocation language. But language was added, modeled after the daycare license ordinance that includes now suspension. It also includes the applicant's right to appeal, or excuse me, the, uh, the licensee's ability to appeal a suspension or revocation. The driver background checked. Right now, the current ordinance states that a driver application is reviewed by the chief of police, but to create flexibility in the police department, we allow the chief of police to actually have, designate his or her designee. Uh, right now, the standards that are used to evaluate the driver licenses are fairly subjective. This ordinance includes specific crimes that need to be reviewed before issuing that driver's license. This ordinance, or this proposed ordinance, makes no changes to the maximum allowed fares, to the business license fee, to the driver's license fee, and also the minimum limits of coverage or of insurance coverage. There is no 24-7 requirement, and there's no limit that's placed on new taxi cabs. To allow for both the city and the vehicle for hire businesses uh, adapt to the new ordinance if it is passed, 
a line or effective date was added in to the ordinance of October 1st of 2014. Uh, we do have uh, representatives from the city attorney's office and also uh, a licensing specialist. Uh, Keith Allenstein in the city attorney's office is going to talk a little bit about the administration's plan for enforcing this ordinance. And then I know that uh, Jamie Palmer, the licensing specialist, will discuss some of the documents that will be used and that some of the changes that have been made. So. Keith Allenstein, City Attorney's Office. Uh, as far as the enforcement uh, portions of this ordinance, that question came up during committee. Uh, we did talk as administration, and uh, there are basically two areas of enforcement that we have to deal with. One is regarding the actual driving behavior and the licensing of the, of the drivers, and then you have the administrative uh, types of enforcement that the businesses would have to follow. Uh, as far as the uh, driver's issues, um, seems most likely that most of those will be handled by the Sioux Falls Police Department. Uh, they would be the ones out on the road uh, that would be able to verify that the license, that the drivers are licensed and any other issues that occur while the vehicle's in motion. As far as the administrative uh, aspects of that, uh, the licensing specialist, uh, Jamie Palmer, would be primarily responsible for those um, since she is a, a one-person uh, office, basically. Uh, we have been uh, informed that uh, she will have at her disposal when she needs investigative services, things like that, uh, to use code enforcement uh, officers to do that. Uh, the one, I guess, undetermined um, point of enforcement on this is the sealing of the taxi meters. Uh, we have not come to a decision yet whether we will put an RFP out for that for a private entity to do that or whether that will be handled by uh, existing city staff. Uh, basically, the way we don't have to calibrate the taximeter, so we don't have to hire somebody or, or figure that out ourselves. Uh, basically, the, the sealing of it would just to verify that it, when the taximeter says it's a mile, it's a mile. Uh, we would attach a seal to that. So, uh, whether you know we can get that accomplished with with existing city personnel or or find uh, a private entity to do that should not be uh, too difficult to do. So, I'm happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Are there any other questions that you might have right now for Keith? Yes, Kermit. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if this is really for Keith, but um, when I've been uh, in taxis, uh, especially in foreign countries, I negotiate before I even get into the taxi. Can can citizens negotiate with taxi drivers here in Sioux Falls? Uh, I guess that's up to the individual taxi cab, and we are going to require that that uh, their their rates be posted, so the the maximum rate as well as as the rate that they're being charged. Uh, there's, I guess, nothing in ordinance, I don't, or in this proposed ordinance, I guess, that that would prohibit them from going below that if they were to negotiate that. I, I, I don't know what the standing practice is with the with the taxi cabs if they're open to negotiation or if that's, uh, would you when you get in you can ask them what the price is and, and that's how it works. I don't I don't know. So offhand, there wouldn't be any prohibition on negotiating uh, as far as. The only, the only, I guess, potential uh, issue would be uh, that we do require that the actual rate to be charged be posted. Um, I don't know that if, if they're charging less than that, I'm not sure that that's something that we're really going to get too upset over or, or try to enforce and say, no, you actually charge the person less than, you, than your posted rate, so therefore we're going to you know, find you in violation of ordinance. I don't, I don't anticipate that that would be the case. Also, Kermit, uh, one more, please. it says there's no changes in maximum allowed fares. So um, I'm not that familiar with this present ordinance dealing with taxi cabs, but are, we're price fixing there. Is that right? We're saying you can't charge above a certain amount? Uh, my understanding, and uh, perhaps Jim David could, could help me out on that, but uh, my understanding is that the present ordinance on this does set a maximum rate that they can charge, yes. Yeah. And what is that? Jim, do you want to address that, please? <clears throat> Councillor Staggers, this is a regional comparison uh, of fares uh, using those same cities. Uh, you'll see here that, and the, again, this is the maximum. You can charge less than this, but the first mile 
is five dollars and seventy five cents. There's a certain equation in in ordinance. It's the first one ninth, one tenth, and then each subsequent mile is three dollars and fifteen cents. Uh, the wait time is forty cents. Uh, if you look below there, you'll notice that Fargo, Lincoln, and Omaha allow taxi cabs to set their own fares pending oversight approval. So they can set their own fares, but it has to be approved by the state or it has to be approved by the city. <coughs> uh, and it's interesting to note, I don't know if I have it uh, in these statistics, but um, uh, Omaha and Lincoln, although they have five taxi cab companies that operate, uh, maybe I do have it here. Um, there are only two owners, ownerships. So they have multiple companies working under one single ownership. So there's really only two ownerships in Omaha, two ownerships in, in Lincoln. So, Just one other question. One more question, please. Jim, um, do you know how long we've had this uh, price fixing on maximum fees? Yeah. It's been around for five years, ten years? or It it's, uh, predates 1980. Uh, I went back as far as the ordinance that existed in 1980, and um, in fact, I, I have it right here. Okay. And uh, it's it's the the rate the fares have changed since 1980, of course. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's we've had fares for forever and ever. Huh? A, exactly. At least predating 1980. Okay. Thanks. Councilor Roffing, please. Thank you. I was going to um, ask, or maybe maybe you can answer this um, on the. Um, Jim, on the uh, uh, checks, uh, the checks for um, the driver background checks. Yes. Are, there, are we doing that on a state basis or a federal basis? You know, I, I might have Assistant Police Chief uh, Lyons come up here uh, to explain that process. <laughs> Patty Lyon, Assistant Chief. They, um, we do local checks, state checks, and then when the applicant uh, puts down that he's lived in other states, we can check those specific states. Okay, would there be a significant difference in doing a federal check all the time? <laughs> we can't. That could, be, that could amount to a lot of money, right? Well, we can't uh, do background checks on like a triple I where we run it through the federal system unless it's for criminal purposes. Oh. Well, let's see. We were, we're just... prohibited to do that. We can do it for criminal investigative purposes for specific reasons. The, but if, uh, we're, if the applicant says that he resided in uh, Iowa, Nebraska, and Montana, then we can specifically ask those states uh, for their uh, background records, huh? on that, on that How subject. How about driving record, though? I mean, because Sam has to do a national check, according to their regulations, they have to do a national check on all the drivers that they have. We can run, uh, we can run backgrounds on drivers, yes through the states. Some states charge. But uh, we haven't had that currently in our okay. uh, system. Hmm. Okay. Are there any other questions at this time? If not, we're going to go to Jamie. I think you were going to finish up here, I think, please. License specialist for <laughs> Jamie. Good evening, Jamie Palmer with Licensing. I was just gonna share with you, um, when someone comes to visit me to inquire about a vehicle for hire business, this is a memo that I share with them and it has kind of bullet points of information that I have to collect from them prior to me issuing the business license and the vehicle for hire decals that they have to place on their vehicles. It also has some generic information, uh, gives them numbers, um, police department that they have to contact, it explains the commercial plates, explains the parking that we have to have approved. Um, it also gives them the phone number um, and the office to contact to register their business name, um, and as well as information about the alcohol carrier's license if they so choose. So it's kind of a, a brief summary of information that I give to them, but as you can see, it, it kind of outlines the information that I need, the, the certificate of insurance, the insurance cards, the operator's permit, commercial plates, and the sales tax license. So I do 
do verify all of that stuff before I give them the license. So, um, and then I'll just briefly go over the business license application. Um, now I have amended this to kind of match the proposed um, revisions in ordinance, such as on um, license type, I've a added the passenger service vehicle before it was just general, um, which the, the vehicles that fell under that were the by appointment um, businesses as well as um, party buses fell under the general, so they will fall under that passenger service vehicle. Um, per the request or much discussion um, about employees and um, we added the line about the federal EIN number, which indicates to us if they have employees. I also did add a line about if they needed more information about that and put the website on there <coughs> where they could find that information. Um, otherwise, it's basically gen general information about the um, applic applicant and where they've lived in the past five years. Um, they do have to um, give answer some basic questions about their previous experience as far as um, driving for a motor vehicle transportation business, um, a general purpose or statement why they want to um, have this business. Then they also have to disclose the address in which um, they will operate or where their vehicles will be parked when they're not in use. And that is the address that I have to forward on to zoning to get approved to make sure that it's an appropriate place for them to operate out of or park. And what that also can do if, if they're parking at home, it could flag them um, to notify them that they would need a home occupation permit. Um, they also have to disclose on the second page, um, they have to disclose the number of vehicles and types of vehicles that they're um, planning to operate. And it also, on the section that I complete, I verify that I have a vehicle inspection form on each vehicle, an insurance card for each vehicle, and then I also um, write the tag number down. Um, at the bottom, I have added a place for them to list the drivers that they are going to be hiring. Um, added a column in there that asks if the driver is an employee, yes or no. Um, and then I also do verify with the police department that they actually have a vehicle for hired operators permit so that they can operate. And on the last page, um, I have them give me their insurance agent's name and company so that I email and phone if they have it so that I can um, contact them if I have any questions about their policy or accuracy or anything like that. So um, another question we added was about the alcohol, um, alcoholic beverage carrier's license, if they have one and the number, if they could disclose that. And then basically it's just them signing to, to verify that all this information is true and correct. Good, thank you, Jamie. Are there any questions for Jamie at this time? Councillor Erpenbach, please. Thank you. Jamie, question about that application. And the application itself is not part of the ordinance. We're not specifically setting in law what the application looks like. We're just suggesting items in the ordinance that go on that application. Is the application itself you know, web friendly? Can I go in? Will I be able to go in and type into it so that I can, I don't have to print it out and write on it? At this point, no. Um, moving forward, though, there is a software change coming forward where you, applicants will be able to apply online, um, but that has, I'm not sure when that's going to be implemented, but it will, it will eventually. It, if I might, is it just, is it a Word document then? This right now, yes, it is a Word document online that they can print. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a PDF document that they can print online. Could it be a word template so people could type into it? It's just, it would just make life easier for businesses, especially if they can just type into it directly. Sure. You know, that, and, and, and if you have word, you can do word templates. So I, I, that would be a request that I would have. I can't put it in ordinance, I can't legislate it, but it would be something that would make it much easier. Sure. Make other question then, if I might, Please. one more about that in terms of convenience for people. Can they just, if they do that, if they fill it out, can they mail it in and you mail the stickers back or is it something they need to come visit with you to get these? The practice has always been that they have to come to me in person um, to obtain 
the decals and I know that the police department requires the drivers to come in person and actually pick up their um, permit at this point as far as I understand that's their process so okay. not to say that they that's, couldn't change but no no I, I think in this case that that's pro that's probably right I mean we're talking about people that are dealing with the public and we're again you know taking responsibility by licensing them so we need to you know have you know some interaction with them no I don't disagree with that I just I would hope that we would work toward you know and, and and that application could be very simply done so that it can be people can download it and type right into it so that would be my one piece of input on that so but thank you for your work it's a an amazing document Councillor Roffing please yeah um, I had a comment on what she was going to say but I'll go the one that I have um, that I can go with right now on um, on the ordinance itself under investigation examination of applicant um, uh, point number four says uh, who has a conviction or date of discharge from prison jail probation or parole within the last 10 years of application for a crime of violence is defined um, I would suggest if we are going to have a 10-year limit or 10-year window on this that then the the application should should ask for 10 years also I noticed that the application only asked five years back and so if the ordinance says 10 years and that should all be 10 years also okay I'll just explain why I did that in section and I don't have it right off the top of my head but it um, section 110 of the ordinance that kind of specifies what certain things we have to ask for on an application it did specify five years but I will check into that um, to see if we can make Doesn't that more it do uniform. any good if we if we ask for 10 years here and we only only demand if you will ask for five years on the application um, that's not they got to be synchronized okay. some way one I'll or the other yeah, thank you Councillor Karski just curious Jamie um, on the EIN is this a tax is this a public document can anybody look at it it is um, if somebody requests to look at the document though there is a lot of information that I redact off there such as the date of birth the sales tax and that EIN number would certainly be one that Accurate. I would redact before okay. I would uh, that but, was my yeah. concern thank you are there any other questions for Jamie at this time any other questions for any of our other people yes please Councillor Jamison thank you uh, either somebody from the uh, uh, public services or Jim mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Would there be a room or a, first off are you the guy with all the glue that's held this whole thing together who is it on because it's really uh, where I saw this from the beginning uh, there's been a lot of loose ends and it seems to have come together quite well uh, is that Jim or is that somebody else yeah Jim? It's, it, it, the, the committee keeps throwing stuff at Jim and then he puts it all together it's been an amazing process well, I think job well done so far that I can tell uh, uh, I've stayed clear of this because it was so messy at the beginning it seems to have cleaned up nice uh, but Jim uh, would there be room or a reason to have a sign somewhere that says if if a passenger is in grievance or has a complaint about the driver that they uh, clearly know where to call or who to call so if they feel like they've been overcharged or that the sure. cab driver took a wrong route or is there a method to any of that well one of the changes that the committee had made <laughs> recently had to do with uh, placing the the maximum fare and then what the taxi cab charges conspicuously in front of the passenger uh, it also would stated that the uh, city needs to actually have the format so everybody uses the same format the same figures uh, right now there's nothing that requires that it could be something that could be added in or if the council wishes it could be an amendment to to require a number uh, consumer hotline of some sort um, so I was just thinking that it might be helpful for uh, you know the uh, drivers to be in notice that there is a clear uh, message given to the passenger that says if they're not happy they've got a place to call but just a thought yep. um, the other one was on the permanent signage uh, is permanent I mean what is permanent I mean if it's painted on surely it could be painted over if it's a sticker it could be removed but have you got a definition for permanent you know I I don't it's um, you know look at Keith for this one so how do you define permanent so not temporary <laughs> it's you know I know the magnetic 
signs. Uh, that's not considered permanent, um, but I'll let Keith talk to this. Well, and if I could, as a member of the committee, I would, I would say we talked a lot about paint, yeah. and we also talked about those, the, the wrap thing. You know, like the police cars all have wraps on them. They're not painted. So that's absolutely what I would consider, Different. you know. But we have said absolutely not magnetic, and if we need to say that, if we need to say don't make, it can't be magnetic, it can't be peeled off, then that would be, I mean, if we need to define permanent, we sure can do that. But we've been really clear in terms of the conversations we've been having. Thank you. Councilor Karski? I guess the other part, I know there's a concern from at least one individual about having to have permanent markings on a vehicle, but the other thing that you have to have in the vehicle is a taxi meter. So if, when you see the outside of the vehicle, if you don't know it's a taxi, when you get in the vehicle and the taxi meter's sitting there, I think it would be quite obvious that you're in a taxi cab. Councilor Ruffin? I have two additional things. Um, Jamie, um, the license that the taxi drivers are, uh, have, I've noticed in a lot of cities uh, when I've taken taxis that they have their picture as part of the license that they put inside the car. Um, is that planned for, with our ordinance? It is required by ordinance right now, and I believe moving forward that is the plan. Just wanted to make sure on that. Secondly, um, for you, Jamie, uh, I noticed that the expiration of licenses is uh, what? February, it goes from February to through January, and it's all at one time? Correct. Wouldn't it make more sense to do that as the licenses expire, that they, when they come in and I get one on March 1st, uh, that then my my um, my license would expire one year later or February 28th and th for two reasons number one I'm gonna sneeze excuse me um, number one it won't have everything happening for you at the same time of the year secondly um, the um, uh, we won't be overcharging so to speak for the even though it's a small fee for the uh, licenses to be gotten if somebody comes in in January and wants to start a business, he's going to pay the same fee that the guy who started last year, February 1st. <laughs> he's going to get 30 days or less for the same price as the guy got one, one whole year. And so it would seem to me to make sense to make that so that it's the day a year later that they do that, and that's going to save you from having everybody come down on you the same day. Just an idea. I think that might be worth considering. Okay. I can check into that. Jim, to check into that, you and Jamie. <laughs> any other questions? Jim, any further comments? Councilor Rolfing, on the, uh, you're talking about the calendar that they have to operate February 1st as a start date. Right now, I think that, is that an ordinance? It's an ordinance right now under so, explanation 24-033. So that, you know, it, if you would, if you'd like, in the second reading, you could do a, an amendment to create some flexibility and allow the administration to decide how they want to formulate that licensing process so everything's not on one single date, February 1st. I mean, that... Think of Jamie and think of the, uh, um, of the licensing fee there, too. I think it makes some sense. Jamie? Um, the only issue that Patty just brought to mind for me um, would be that the decals are color coded each year, and to for one to kind of help the police officers if they see someone driving and say, like, "Oh, it's a green tag, they're valid," um, or they automatically know if it's a red tag, it's invalid right now because they know it, they're color coded each year. So that might create a bit of confusion. Don't do anything to the license? The actual it's tag. The tags on the license plate? On the actual <laughs> vehicle, yeah. Taxi license. That would make it, but we could type, we could put a month and a year on that and have them all green and or whatever, like they do with the license plates, our regular license plates now. Yeah, and they're, they're pretty small. I don't know that there's... <clears throat> Tom, chair? What? Please. Um, something to go along with this. I thought we were going to increase the size of this sticker also to make it uh, easier viewing for our officers. Um, as far as uh, the dates and that, I, I guess 
you know, that could be something that we could continue to discuss as, you know, we go into second re in between first and second readings, mm -hmm. too. Okay, we could probably address that, Jim. Could we get maybe a little bit more information between the first and the second reading of this, possibly? Kenny, you were talking about the, the size of the sticker, like Jamie brought to our attention. It is fairly small. Jamie, could you hold that up? Or D Jim, please, one more time. The sticker, sticker is fairly small. Um, I think we discussed that in, in uh, committee, and I thought we were going to come up with a, is this the normal sticker that has been? I thought we were going to come up with a larger sticker that was going to be easier to see. So that's something I, I'd, I'd like to maybe check on. I don't know if there's going to be a, a larger cost with that. Of, of course, there probably is, but, you know, maybe a size bigger than what that is right now. Okay. I can certainly check into that. Yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Councilor Staggers, please. Yeah, just a quick question here about the sales tax. Uh, what kind of sales tax are they supposed to collect? Six percent, seven, or... Well, that varies. Um, if it's a, a pickup and drop off within city limits, it would be 6%. Okay. And if it's a pickup in Sioux Falls outside of city limits, it's 4%. And if it's a pickup in Sioux Falls to out across state lines, say the casino, um, they can't charge any tax. Okay. And um, so what we have here these maximum rates, 575 for the first mile, it's, it's not really the, the rate at all because they have to charge the, the most likely charge a sales tax. Well, Do you have any provision saying sales tax not included or? Well, I did add a line at the bottom and that was difficult to decide how to do that as well because they, just for example, on the rates above, if they opt to include the sales tax within their prices, they're, right. they're within their rights to do that. So I wasn't sure. This is just merely an example. Um, you know, we could put something on there about additional sales back may or may not be charged. Um, it's, it's, just, it's really difficult to, to say because all companies probably do it different unless we mandate that they do it a certain way, So, which would be difficult as well. Councilor Steggers, I will tell you that if you are registered with the state as a business and if you are taking, collecting sales tax, I can assure you the state makes sure that they get their percentage of the sales tax. Yes, I'm, I'm well aware of that. Yes. But will the citizen know this when they get in the cab that if they go to a Grand Falls Casino, there's not going to be a sales tax? I, but they might charge them anyway. <laughs> right. And yeah, the, yeah they're, they're, the city would be paid that tax that they collected, and really they shouldn't have. But an average citizen probably wouldn't know that. So. Yeah, right. Is there any other questions? I think there are a couple of questions that we asked for that we want to try to get some answers for, too, before the first and the second reading, in between there. Councillor Anderson, you had another question, please. Not a question, just a quick statement. Please. Um, number one, I want to thank the members of the Public Services Committee, Sue Aguilar, Dean Karski, Michelle Erfenbach. We put in over a year of work on this. This was something that was brought to us by the taxi companies. You know, it, when it first started, it wasn't just to take a look at the whole ordinance. There was some problems within uh, the, between the companies. And the first few meetings were a challenge, um, just to even get the companies to talk to each other civilly. <coughs> We've gotten to do, do that now. And they, they've actually come together as a group. And each meeting have brought proposals and and questions to us that have helped form this ordinance. I'm not saying it's a perfect ordinance. I, I, I will say it is not a perfect ordinance. And it probably will need some adjusting and changing as we move forward. Um, but it was darn good work. And all, all three of you working with me, I appreciate it. And uh, I think that it just shows you know, what our city's about and what this, this council has been about. And that is allowing public testimony and taking that information in and putting something together that works for our city. So once again, thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Anderson. I appreciate that very much. Thanks. Councillor? Are we going to take public uh, testimony at this point? On no, we're not. Uh, we're doing no, we're not. This evening. Okay. Yep. So. Okay. They, they will have a chance at second reading. Uh, there will be an opportunity for people to speak to the issue. Uh, are there any other questions at this time? Is there anything else to come before the chair on the part of the council? There being none, I'd just like to remind everybody again that the uh, informational meeting, committee meeting next Tuesday has been canceled and all items on the council agenda have been postponed till the April 15th meeting and that we will have a work session on, uh, on uh, April 10th. So there being nothing else before this committee, meeting adjourned.